to the organs of your body. That also includes the peripheral organs, such as, uh, you know, your skin is an organ, your vascular system is an organ, and, you know, the tissues of your, your muscles, nerves, all this other kind of thing. Think of different organ systems, right? And let's say, for example, we have our finger here, right? Well, what happens is that our blood's going to have problem perfusing particularly peripheral organs, because let's say that we have an area that's more central, right? Our central area may have something called anastomoses, which means it's supplied by multiple uh, blood pathways. But the peripheral organs are going to show their symptoms first because they don't receive as rich a supply of blood. So one thing that we should know about this particular disease is Disease, actually I would call it more of a condition, right? So this thing is, uh, it has a positive feedback mechanism that makes it particularly dangerous and not only that, but it is actually a medical emergency classifiable as a medical emergency, okay? So this is very serious and it can compound on itself, okay? So there are some symptoms that do tend to repeat themselves in the different types of shock. And today we're going to talk about four different types of shock, with maybe an additional fifth one that we're going to talk about a final classification. By this information was compiled off of Wikipedia, so your class notes may be a little bit different. They may not include the fifth version, they might, but you know, I do find it to be a reliable resource. So let's move on. Before I was talking about the heart, and I was talking about the uh, pumping to peripheral organs, and to help us memorize the different types of shock, okay? One thing that will probably help you is thinking about the heart and the peripheral organ, and what can go wrong to perfuse this particular guy. The first thing is we could lose blood, a whole lot of it, in fact. If we lose a whole lot of blood, then it's obvious that it will be difficult for us to perfuse these end organs, just because there's not enough blood to reach there, okay? This is also known as hypovolemic shock. Low hypovolemic volume. So, this particular shock is notable for certain symptoms that we would expect to see, such as cold and clammy fingers. This is because the blood can reach there, so it can't really engage in the metabolic processes and it can't really stay warm. What other processes would happen? Well, as a person does not get blood out to their system, they start to engage in a little bit more anaerobic respiration, right? The lactic acid starts to build up. This lactic acid is going to cause a state of respiratory acidosis, right? Well, actually metabolic acidosis, and then from there, they're going to actually try to correct this with their breathing. So they're going to breathe in and out, breathe in and out, in and out very fast. And this is also usually accompanied by rapid, shallow breathing. Now, most of the type of shocks, in fact, um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Maybe in some rare cases, in some of the last ones I'm going to talk about, like the endocrine-related shocks, you may have increased blood pressure, but for almost universally, you're going to have low blood pressure. And hypovolemic shock is no exception. You lose all the blood, of course you're going to have low blood pressure, right? Your body will try to take certain actions to raise that blood pressure, and it's very unlikely it's going to be able to overcome that particular, you know, the fact that you just have all this blood missing, right? It'll try to uh, activate the angio, um, the aldosterone system, angio-angiotensin. And, you know, it probably won't be successful as possible. It might be successful with, uh, you know, certain combination of other diseases. Okay. Next we have cardiogenic, and I'm going to say obstructive, because apparently in some cases, obstructive is considered to be a subclass of cardiogenic. So if we talk about the blood missing, what happens if something happens to the heart and we 
make it so the heart can't really pump as well, right? Some kind of cardiac disease, something of that nature. Right? Something, uh, maybe we killed off some cells here and can't just pump as hard. That's known as cardiogenic shock. Once again, we have some similar symptoms, right? Cold fingers, right? We're going to have the low blood pressure, the rapid breathing, right? And the core organ diffusion. Okay, and also both of them will also have tachycardia. The heartbeat will start to raise to try to make up for the fact that the uh, volume of blood is not getting to the end organs and the tissues are really calling for oxygen. But one thing that's kind of special with the cardiogenic series of shocks are the fact that it can't pump as greatly, right, means that blood's going to start to back up into the system. And you'll actually start to get some, another pump. Lungs are over here. There are some pulmonary arteries, pul pulmonary veins that carry blood from the lungs back to the heart. That system is going to start to get backed up, and you're going to have some pulmonary effusion as the blood backs up into the lungs, and then the liquid seeps out, and you have problems. Also, what you can experience is distended jugular veins. Okay? What's going to happen is that once again the blood is backing up. We have the superior vein cava, which you know, is supplied by the jugular veins, and it's going to back up, back up, and then you're going to see the stel, you know, distended jugular veins. Okay? So, cardiogenic shock can also happen in certain cases of endocrine disorders, right? I guess this is a little introduced now. This is our fifth class. Or, you know, it's, it's not so set because there's multiple you know, different kinds of these can actually be caused by hormone problems, right? Let's suppose that someone was anemic, right? They just didn't make a lot of red blood cells. Or they had some type of uh, sickle cell anemia where all their blood was actually, large amounts of their blood was destroyed, right? That could classify under hypovolemic shock, right? There could be also hormone disorder that caused them to just produce less red blood cells. Once again, that would classify as endocrine and hypovolemic shock, hypothyroidism, thyrotoxis, these kinds of diseases, right, which affect the thyroid, can affect our heart rate, and if our heart rate goes down, then, you know, we're going to have some cardiogenic shock going on. Obstructive shock is something's plugging the vessels that actually, or the heart itself, or something blocking the passageway, it's obstructive. It's quite intuitive, right? So, it could be the aorta, aortic stenosis, right? Some kind of narrowing of the vessel here. We could have some type of cardiac tamponade, right? Some uh, object is lodged inside of the heart, making it difficult for it to pump out the blood. And this would be obstructive, and honestly, the symptoms are almost indistinguishable from the cardiogenic shock, which is usually why it's paired together, right? It also has some relationship with the cardiovascular system, right? They're both part of it. Now the last one we're going to talk about is something called distributive shock. And in distributive shock, this is the problem not with the blood, not with the heart, but actually of the organ itself. Right? So let's suppose that something is going on with these cells here where they can't really use oxygen. They can't really use uh, the respiratory procedures that would end up using, uh, that would allow the blood to perfuse into the area correctly, right, and supply the tissue correctly. It's actually at the end site. So, like I said, it's a destination problem. Now, this one is actually unique in that the fact that your end organs can't receive um, the, the blood because of the cells themselves, they release some factors that will try to enrich the area with blood so that they can be surrounded by a higher concentration, maybe some of that, those nutrients can seep in. So, in this case, right, while these ones are all going to be remarkable for cold extremities, this one is actually going to be warm. The person will be warm, okay, because the blood is all seeping into those areas. Now, let's suppose that someone actually has a distributive disease, which is often going to be, could be like endocrine, right? could be other things, could be some type of, uh, you know, necrosis or something like that, right? Let's suppose someone with necrosis, right? While the nurse is wheeling them over to the, you know, to the surgery room, right? 
kind of what happened is that they all of a sudden have, you know, they get cut on a doorway and then they start to leak, leak massive amounts of blood. Can they have distributive and hypoglycemic shock at the same time? Absolutely. In fact, it's even worse because the person already has their, you know, system compromised and then you're going to add to that fact, it's going to make it worse. And the thing is that you might be wondering, well, are they going to be warm? Are they going to be cold? Well, it depends on, honestly, which system is working and which system is winning, right? If you have a small cut even, to lose a small amount of blood, let's say maybe a cup's worth of blood, will not be good, you know? Because the body's already struggling with that particular issue, but if it's a small amount, perhaps the distributive system will be more powerful, right? But I suppose it's a very large amount, like a liter of blood. You're probably dead at that point, okay? But if you lose, like, let's say, a liter of blood, then your body will probably just not have enough blood to carry to the destination sites, and you will end up becoming cold anyways, right? Now, there's some types of shock that are classically known to be distributed. Septic shock, okay? This can be caused by a huge systemic infection. Usually, uh, you might see this in the hospital. Right, they're dead. Remember, this is a medical emergency, so anybody with shock does end up in the hospital. Usually, someone with septic shock, right, they may have a bacterial infection that somehow has gone amok. Anaphylactic shock, they can't breathe properly. Right, their throat way got constricted, and uh, this can actually lead to a loss of blood perfusion. Neurogenic shock. Let's suppose that I hurt my spine, the, like the upper part of my spine, right? What, this, what can happen is that this can actually impact certain sympathetic pathways, and sympathetic pathways are going to activate our fight or flight response. That's going to make our heartbeat increase, and, and it's going to make our, the contractility of the heart increase, right? So, if someone has neurogenic shock, their sympathetic system is compromised due to the spinal injury, and the sympathetic system can't really innervate the heart properly, and you end up having, you know, which type of shock would you classify that as? Would it be hypoglycemic? You know, there's no loss of blood. Would it be cardiogenic? Yes, because actually you are saying that the heart itself is having problems pumping, right? So, once again, this word cardiogenic is a little bit of a misnomer, probably the most tricky part about the whole thing, because we call it cardiogenic. In this case, you might think, well, they didn't really start in the heart. And you might say, no, right? But actually, because the heart is, I guess the, and I was saying genic was kind of in the beginning, right? I would maybe say like the end reason, right? It's the final reason out of all the procedures that really kind of makes it so that your blood pressure is low and the uh, end organs are perfused poorly, okay? And one last time, let's say distributive shock, right? Do you expect them to have a high blood pressure? Or a low blood pressure. Well, this is can be confusing, right? You have more blood going to the extremities, so does that make the blood pressure go up? Well, actually, in this case, I would have to say no. Okay, even though you have more vasodilation, it's really because of uh, blood vessels kind of expanding, right? Vasodilation. It's not really because of the heart pumping harder. Okay. So your blood pressure is not going to go up. I hope this cleared up things for you, and I know it's going to help me, and I hope it will help you. All right, that's it. Thanks for checking out SGU TV. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out our other videos.